This week, the Security Weekly crew discusses how to convey the security message outside the echo chamber. Security news this week includes hacking satellites and lessons learned from cracking Ashley Madison website passwords and a whole lot more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from Cheat Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild. Packets aren't the only things getting sniffed. Systems aren't the only things getting penetrated. Functions aren't the only things getting wrapped. Bits aren't the only things getting banged. And the cocktails, they flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. This episode is sponsored by NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise-level online scanning service. For more information, visit their website at netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring. Everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash Tenable Jobs. If you are listening to this show, check out the following two positions, both technical and both are work from home. A Nessus Vulnerability Research Engineer and a C Software Engineer. Brought to you by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean, pen-testing machine. For all those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And finally, Bionapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at Onapsis.com. It's time to fire up a packet capture, pour yourself an adult beverage, and give the intern control of your password cracker, because here's your host. He's a man that gives 50-cent blowjobs with pliers and a wet sock, Paul Asadorian. Ouch. (laughs) Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Security Weekly. I'm, of course, as Larry said, your host, Paul Asadorian, for episode 423 for September. Is it third? Yes, September 433, even. For September 3rd. Wow. A lot of threes in there. Wow. 2015. Joined in studio by Mr. Larry Pesci. Welcome, Larry. Back, finally. Yes, in finally. studio. Both of you in studio. Uh, uh, Jack yeah, Daniel it's is like here as well. old times. I know. It's like old times. We're like in st- all in studio together. It's wonderful. We're drinking and commiserating, and it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's good. We, and we just, got email, we just got email from John Strand, so. He can't make it? I don't know. I haven't read it yet. Oh, okay. Probably not. It was a rumor that John Strand might join. Carlos Perez, though, uh, is on the lines via yes. Skype. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Happy to be here. Yes, it's good to have you. You're in your usual position, which is nice. And I, I see also, uh, again, thanks for joining, Mr. Carlos Perez. Uh, wonderful to have you. We don't have an interview, uh, so we've got a, a great topic to talk about, so I'm anxious to hear all of your uh, opinions and thoughts yep. on that. At least and I think I am. John needs someone to Skype him in. And John uh, is right there, that. and it's John look Strand, at, live on holy. Security Weekly. It is John Strand. Welcome, John. <laughs> <laughs> For a <laughs> brief moment there, John Strand was on the show. If you blinked, you missed you, you it. Missed what a, that's you, it. You'll what a, see. What a <sighs> cock tease. What a <laughs> cock tease. <laughs> he had this kind of look on his face, and really the video was frozen. That was pretty funny. <laughs> Hold on. Let's see if we can. Are we going to get him back? Cock tease. That, John, are you there? <laughs> He gave his classic "What the hell?" Although we couldn't hear him. Is it? Yeah. Is your is your audio on, John? My audio is on. Yay! Yay! And we all rejoice. Yay. Wow! And they all ate Robin's minstrels. And you're uh, so, stalking so Paul, in a car Paul, somewhere. Take, Paul, take your hand. Yeah. Hold it up. Move it to the right. Further, 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 further. Almost to the wall. Almost to the wall. Drop it down. Drop it down further, further. Bring it back, just a hair. No, down. Bring it down to the table. There we go. Pick it up and read to me what is on that bottle, sir. Oh, the bottle. Oh, the bottle. Okay. It is Defiant Whiskey. Oh. Have you had Defiant Whiskey before? I have not had Defiant Whiskey. They're, a, spo- got- they're a sponsor. I'm glad you mentioned that. They're a sponsor of our Stogie Geek show, and they're getting a free plug on Security Weekly right now. <laughs> Hello to Mark and Tim at Defiant Whiskey. 
it's I'm, I'm actually I'm actually on the so, on the show right now sober and I and I think I could say defiant whiskey whenever John needs to get completely plastered for security weekly you would like you would drink this whole bottle dude if once you got a couple glasses and you would you couldn't be a control yourself what what are we drink what is this this was with defiant whiskey this might be the cocktail for defiant whiskey let me uh let me, let me dig up what they call it so I, I don't... Yeah, this yes. one was really good. And it goes so, really well with a cigar. I think it's my pick. So, you know, we had to drink a lot of cocktails yes. before we figured out which one we liked best. Yes. So I get it. I, we, I, we may have to go around again. I, I start, I'm starting to feel a little bit like uh, Jim McMurray. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we were doing some looking it around at the house the other, the other day. And in fact... Hey, you, you would you're gonna be kind of blown away by this a little bit, Paul. Given that you know maybe a year ago I wouldn't have even touched a Scotch bourbon whiskey rye any of that because <laughs> I know I couldn't drink long, it. Yeah, um, we actually went to IKEA and spent a thousand dollars on furniture for our dining room. Wow, mostly so we can have storage space to put my bourbon and nice. my rye and my whiskey. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Have you watched any of the tipsy bartender like behind the scenes videos? No. One is in his kitchen, and the door is open to his pantry, and his pantry has no food, food. in it, but every shelf from floor to ceiling, it's like alcohol. in the entire pantry, is alcohol. It's pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. Yep. Um, my, so this, <coughs> my, wife, my wife has started to taking to drinking gin, and I think we have thirteen different bottles of gin nice. at home right now. In either. So you are drinking. We've we've had a round of Defiant Lemonades, which is Defiant whiskey, ginger beer, uh, lemonade, and uh, we don't have fresh lemons, so I didn't adulterate it with anything else. But that's that. Uh, and we're also playing really with some good. other things. Um, we're playing. I could drink a lot things. of these in the summer. Yeah, that's that's it's uh, that's the point. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's pretty strange. It's two ounces of uh, Defiant, three ounces each of ginger beer and fresh lemonade, and garnish with a slice of lemon, adjust to taste. But it's you know it's six ounces of non-alcohol, two ounces of alcohol. So it still has a kick, but it goes down smooth. And actually, mm, right. the, the ginger has more of a bite than the, the whiskey at that yeah, ratio. Yeah, um, it's interesting. We're on our second case of Defiant whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> talking, to the, talking to Mark, and he's like, uh, he's like, so you guys. I'm like, yeah, we need, we could do some more. I'm like, he's like, oh, I'm gonna send you another case. I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? Make it two. So, yeah. <laughs> so last week we uh, we had some of the Defiant Gold Rushes, mm. you know, a variation on the Gold Rush using Defiant, uh, which is the standard, you know, classic cocktail, honey syrup and uh, lemon juice. And that wasn't uh, my favorite. I need to bring fresh, fresh lemons, yeah. Fresh lemons and good fresh honey, honey yeah. that's made into a good a balanced, balanced syrup. Balanced syrup, yep. I agree. The, the trick is, um, honey is really weird to get to dissolve thoroughly. Yes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can stir the heck out of it or shake it, and it still won't dissolve. You really right. need to heat it up, add water, and, and make a syrup. Um, unlike like maple syrup, which mm-hmm. you can get to stick without thinning it, I mm-hmm. find, but you got to work at it. Yeah, honey just never blends in unless you you do it. It needs to be fairly. And then you made it old fashioned. This is all. This is all. This is all fantastic. But when do we start talking about the virtues of Coors and Seagram Seven? Yeah. <laughs> no. We'll no. Do, John, we'll do that in <laughs> Vegas next week. That's right. That's then you made it old, no, no, old fashioned with the defiant whiskey. The old fashioned defiant whiskey. Was good. I like that one too. Yeah, so the old fashioned, just classic old fashioned, using Defiant, um, Fee These Brothers, bitters, yeah, Fee Brothers, uh, Black Walnut Bitters, mm-hmm. and um, I used uh, some agave. I think it would have been a little bit better balance with something like I've been playing with tonight with the Turbinado Simple Syrup. Nice, uh, which uh, we'll do. But you know, in another month or so, we'll have a. Enhanced uh, bar and bar mm-hmm. area. That's right. That's, bar a, that's area. what I need. That's what I need to do, Jack. Is I need to go and make some of my own bitters. I haven't. I yeah. yet to do that. It's one of those things I threatened. Hacking at its finest. Um, mm. Let's see. Purchase your hack naked T-shirts and stickers online at shop.securityweekly.com for a limited time only. Use the discount code Hack Naked Summer and get fifty percent off your order. It's a summer blowout sale and it ends on September twenty third which is the first official day of fall. Again, discount code HackNakedSummer. You get 50% off. Visit shop.securityweekly.com. Also, I have a note that Tenable is looking for a technical director. It is a work-from-home position in the U.S. Jack, I don't think the title quite 
describes the, the, the position. Title is very Tell vague. me more. <laughs> it, it's similar to a product evangelist position, actually, which was my it's, former position. Uh, yeah, it, and we need to clarify because the, there have been a lot of people that have done the evangelist role well, and some who haven't. So that that title has sort of been damaged. But the word technical is in this job description because yep. you need you to understand stuff, right. how mm-hmm. this works. You need to be technical. Uh, understand that doesn't mean you you know you, you need to commit a couple thousand lines a day to your GitHub account. But it right, does mean right. you need to, to be able to use products, obviously Tenable's products in particular. But mm-hmm. you need to you know be interested in technology and engaged in the technology community. Um, you know, we have a couple of folks that are in that role currently uh, outside the U.S. Yep, Gavin. Uh, Gavin is doing that. And for <clears> those <throat> those of our listeners in Europe or who know Gavin, um, that's what he does. He talks to a lot of people, listens to a lot of people, takes you know, brings feedback inbound, but has as technical expertise um, to to help guide conversations when talking to customers and prospects. And, Ga- and Gavin sent me some feedback about the Flash topic we talked about because you wrote an article about Flash. Yep. And um, <clears throat> was kind of laughing at the fact that the videos on the site that he wrote for Where, were Flash. Right. When he wrote the article about Flash. He also says that HTML5 does have um, uh, copy, uh, copy protections built into it. It, it does, yeah. depend, but... There are so many different, you know. HTML5 is not this. This, it's right. Yeah. It's, uh, and so, uh, those uh, for our friends in Australia, or Asia Pacific, you might have come across Dick Boussier, who uh, yep. does that as He's well. The other one, and, and the other one, and we're looking for somebody for that role because there are a lot of us who have evolving roles at Tenable, who are yes. you know publicly visible. You, myself, Carlos, um, but they keep like wanting us to do stuff, right? So mm. Marcus and I are out doing. Marcus and I stuff and Space Rogue's doing his thing and this would be that kind of focused role and it would um, you know you'd be working with us um, working with our products and it's uh, it's cool because what you guys have figured out is look we we like where we work we like the company we work for and the people we work with but we get to be really candid about uh, the way we see the world and yeah. that's one of the that's one of the things this isn't a, a hamstrung role either and so you need to be comfortable generating content though so if you <laughs> yes uh, you gotta Write blog posts and do all that do, stuff. You know, yeah. do webcasts. You got to be comfortable in public. Um, uh, so it is definitely a public facing role, but it's a cool role. And I don't know how you're. What's the official way to find out? But obviously, reach out to Paul or I. Yeah. Reach out to us directly. We'll absolutely. We'll, we'll give you the, the we'll lowdown. But um, you know, come join us. We're having we're having fun and growing like mad. It's and, true. Uh, I uh, concur with both those things. Um, speaking of talking candidly, we're going to talk about talking outside the echo chamber right now. In Thanks. fact, Jack, you received some email from someone uh, named Dallas. Yep. Dallas writes in and says, Jack, you gave a talk at B-Sides Cleveland, and around the 56-minute mark, you mentioned getting out and giving business slash executives high-level talks about security, DBIR, etc. I was curious if you had a rundown of some kind of the talking points you make. Uh, sure, you. Uh, some of the talking points you make, sure you include. Maybe this would be a good side topic for the Security Weekly crew. And Jack said, I think we should talk about this. Yeah. And we all said, so, yeah, 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 let's talk about this. So um, one of the challenges we've always talked about is how to communicate security effectively to management. I think we briefly right. cover that and then get kind of deeper in. I like your idea yeah. of getting outside the echo chamber. Right. I think mm-hmm. that's important. So first we have to say, Michael, I'm sorry, because this is something that Michael does a lot of. Mm. And it's his it's wor- you know his world. Um, but I think that we all have, have some perspective. And, you know, starting out with my – I try to give talks to uh, the less – security focused organizations in the area at least once a year i don't always come through with that right now i'm playing the scheduling game where i got given four uh four months to give talks at one um one group and i will be at least 1000 miles away for every one of the months uh, but i'm trying to do i try to do that and it there are a couple of things so you get outside of um we got to define echo chamber too right cuz for a lot of us Going to an ISSA or ISACA meeting is actually a little bit outside of where we normally deal with. We tend true. to, I we like tend that. to yeah. deal with mm. technical people. You know, we're we're at B sides, we're at DerbyCon, we're at SchmooCon, 
we're at DEF CON, we're at Black Hat. And even though there's certainly some overlap, once you get into a regional ISACA or ISSA meeting, you're into a management level. And people that come to things from a different perspective. And then once you get to, you know, InfraGuard, you're still in a security thing, but it's a different audience. It's not our audience. And then once you get out and you get the opportunity to speak to, you know, people that are doing startups or developers or... Yeah, there's a lot of different audiences, just, Jack. It's a great right. point because sometimes I will have material that I'll deliver at a B-Sides event, that I'll deliver at a Derby Con. And then if you try and take that same content, the way it's packaged, and you give it even at a Source Boston, which has that mixture of people, or then you try go and give it in a more corporate setting or an Isaka, it doesn't translate well. Mm. Like there's a, You have to adjust your message for your audience. Definitely. And I've definitely fallen victim to that and just not thought enough ahead about how I need to tune my content. Yep. And man, it's super important. You can lose your audience. They they don't want to hear so much about how to break things and how they're broken yep. as much as they want to hear how to fix, fix them. It. I mean, yep. they're both important messages, but you may convey that things are broken message differently yep. Yep. to that, that audience. Absolutely, and yeah, I've done I've done that same that same thing with uh, taking some of the presentations that we've done to technical audiences to yeah. lesser technical audiences like ISACA and those types of things. And that was definitely something that I learned sort of right. up front was that. Let's talk about the breaking of things, but let's make it a little bit more fun and more entertaining. Yeah. Well, so I mean, if, you're, if I'm talking about reverse engineering firmware to people who are out there reverse engineering firmware, like, yeah, we have a great time. You can convey the message in a certain way. Uh, a great time yep. talking about the tech and the bits and bytes. And, you know, I, I think mm -hmm. there's certain different humor that I use, yeah. certainly with that audience yep. that I found. And when you take it to more technical folks, I think you want to you want to summarize. I think some more of those technical details. Yep. Your messages are totally different, right? You want to convey to them that things are broken in a slightly different manner, um, and then you want to spend, I think, a little more time about how to fix the problem. I, I find that there are a couple of resources, and I, it's narrowed down. Um, there are a variety of reports that I find um, people respect. And sometimes that's good and sometimes it's not. Uh, so uh, I think the the Mandy and M Trends report, uh, sorry, folks, it's not DBIR. what it used to be, right? <clears throat> the M Trends, I have not found, uh, you know, in recent years as, as valuable as it used to be. At the, you know, I've, M Trends did have value. Uh, FireEye reports, um, I haven't really dug into as much. Uh, the TrustWave reports years ago I thought were great. TrustWave yep. has got a different focus, and their reports aren't. But the DBIR is the one that you know we go to. In the first couple of years, it was imperfect, but they were obviously making an effort, and it's been getting better, progressively better. The current DBIR, this year's DBIR, I think there are fewer numbers and more words about numbers, was yep. my summary. And uh, some of us that like to play with numbers – miss the numbers, but the reality is the stories are more valuable to most people. And I think that that's a, a good example. Um, I'm not going to go off on the full rant, but you do run into folks that want to talk about some of the vendor-driven reports. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, we've had this conversation, um, last time Richard Baitlick and I was on, mm -hmm. we discussed mm -hmm. it. It's like, how do you get value out of a vendor report knowing that there's inherent biases? Bias, right. It's like, well, you know, kind of peel it back, accept the biases, and see if there's anything interesting in there. Right. So that's there. I can't not say it, but it's like, let's, uh, just no rant. No rant. I got that out of my system last week. <laughs> let me just say this. I don't believe ranting. it. I don't believe it, though. Yeah, go listen. Friends. No, I don't believe it. I got it out of a system. Oh, no. yeah, that's true. Friends don't let friends cite Ponemon. <laughs> um, that was good. It was ranty. Uh, yeah, it was a little, little, rant, little needs, splash of rant in there, it Jack. It needs to be a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> and again, if you are talking to an informed <coughs> audience that's willing to put the work into it, there's data there. But Ponemon conclusions... I don't agree with, um, and I'm not alone. I want to, John. John, so, are you there? Did we lose John? Yeah, we the lost pivotal him. moment when I wanted yeah. to include him in the conversation. So, so, but any one of those, you find those. The DBIR I find is universally respected, and it's um, it's got some actionable things. And the great thing about working off something like DBIR um, is that 
like using the the SANS now CSC 20, it's not PCI Council saying you need to do this. It is here is information based on the real world. You should take the parts of it that apply to you and apply them as they work in your environment. So the DBIR stuff works that way. One of the challenges, though, is DBIR says uh, the new and newsworthy stuff really will hose you, but also the stuff that's ancient and boring will hose you. Yep. And the top threats are top threats, but then 7 million others are going to hose you. So basically they say patch everything instantly, which is you know not viable. But there, there's a lot more to it than that. But... I find that you have to reach the audience, and it's great to screw up, I think. Um, it's not fun when you do it, but it's great to go to an audience and, like, get it wrong. Yeah. And hopefully you can recover during that talk. You can do damage control. Yep. And when you're like, oh, I got – no, this this – this is not a Shmoocon crowd. Uh, wait a minute. Time, Time out. out. <laughs> wait a minute. Uh, Let me put okay. down the beer. <laughs> let's go this way. Uh, yeah. um, let's go this way. And then you hit, um, then you hit the, the, B, the B button on your keyboard, and it blanks the screen and goes uh, yes. black. <laughs> like, we're not going to use that slide that's coming up either. We're not going there. I wish, so I, <laughs> I, wish I had done that at a couple of presentations. Yeah. Right. So... Yeah. You, you know, so it's good to be proven wrong, especially when we get comfortable, right? Because, you know, we, we go and talk. To so you, you, if you do it right, we think about who the audience is, and you think about, you can't make generalizations, right? So the, right. the Isaka crowd here in Rhode Island yep. is, I think, more technical than other Isaka crowds I've been around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the ISSA chapter in Raleigh, for example, is much more tech or in uh, the Kentuckiana, you know, some of them skew more technical, some of them skew more management. Right. Um, one I spoke at was pretty much purely really big financials. And that took some shifting because mm -hmm. it was all financial executives. And I, it was even knowing that going in, I had to like, Oh, I'm, lose in the audience I need to right. so what do they what do they care about so if you do a little research right so w what are their jobs you know who are these folks what was that is it John again I don't know I just no it was me I, I made oh, it my, uh, my yeah so Car Carlos it would, yeah, I actually wanted to go to yeah. you as well um, what are your thoughts on the reports like DBIR and things like that and do you incorporate those into you know your job or you know some of the things that you're doing uh, uh, I actually do. In fact, uh, another one that I tend to look at is the ones that Microsoft put out, also yes. Cisco. They tend to be very two good ones. And as uh, kind of reiterating what Jack was saying is, one of the basic rules of any presenter is know your public. You, As you mentioned, that is a very basic rule. I'm not going to be giving a, a technical presentation to people who are not technical and at the same time I'm not giving technical guys a business type presentation you need to know your audience always when you're doing this type of presentation and that's one of the things I like about also those reports because I do get hints uh, they they do bring the business side and they also cover the technical side so I get hints on how can I approach the business side and present the data in a way that is going to influence them uh, in a good way. Uh, I, I also look at them like how did they break down the graph, the graphs, how did they break down the uh, risks, uh, how are they presenting those risks, and then when I go into the appendix or further down the, the read, then I start seeing them go more technical into their details. So that gives me kind of an idea, okay, these are the technical stuff, this is how they're presenting it. Uh, it makes sense to me. It doesn't make sense. So I, I, I kind of use it kind of um, as an example to later on use, imitate, or avoid, depending on how they presented the data. Now, John, you're back? Yep. Okay, good. I want to ask you, um, because you have a lot of experience presenting as well, so how do you tune between technical audience and, and management? Because you have a, a lot of success presenting to executives. In fact, you get requests from executives to come speak. So you've got some secret sauce there. Well, it, it, it kind of boils down to one simple thing. If you have a choice of sitting down and going through pie charts, bar graphs, and numbers, 
or telling a story, tell a story every single time. Mm. Um, people resonate far more with narratives and stories than they do with uh, DBR reports. And, and there's a couple of reasons for this. One of the main reasons is whenever somebody looks at like the Verizon data breach report, they look at, uh, I think in 2013, it was 341 companies that Verizon worked with that were compromised. And their key takeaway from that is not, this is how people were compromised or this is how they discovered the breach. Their key takeaway that they take away from those numbers is there's 341 companies that suck at computer security. <laughs> they, they, they basically try to create a separation as much as possible between them and the companies that have been compromised. And they do that for a couple of reasons. They do that because it makes them feel better about who they are. It allows them to sleep better. And it allows them to remain relatively, relatively ignorant to the, uh, the similarities that they would have with these organizations. However, if I'm talking to somebody that's in, uh, let's say, manufacturing, and I say, last year we did five pen tests for companies that are manufacturing companies that are of the same size and complexity of your organization, and we were able to break into all five because they're all five are kind of t making these same mistakes again and again and again and again, then it becomes a, a, a tighter narrative that they can actually resonate with. And usually you put, some, you put a narrative and a story behind it, and that tends to resonate a lot more. But if we just throw numbers at things, then we're a bunch of tech geeks trying to throw numbers at things, and we're going to continue to look like the propeller head IT people of years past. Yep. Absolutely. And let me, um, something that I, I assume Michael would agree with, which is uh, one of the things that drives me nuts is when people talk about dumbing things down for management. It's like, <clears throat> no, what you need to do is simplify it and Making things concise is a word I like to use. Mm -hmm. That's hard. I mean, taking th making it concise, not wasting people's time, making the most points in the least amount of time, and making it digestible. It, and, and that's where, John, like you said, if there's a narrative, if there's a story, if there's something to relate to that, that is real, that's not a spreadsheet, that's not a pie chart, like it... Don't dumb it down. It needs to be very intelligent, but it's mm -hmm. really, really well, hard to be concise. And accurate. And, and that's my problem because one of my audiences is our sales team. And it has to be accurate. We can't spread FUD, right? But it has to be concise enough and clear enough for, to be able to, for me to teach the sales team to be able to speak about certain subjects. That's, well, that's hard. It, it, let's talk about the concise and that accuracy. Just kind of go a little bit further. Uh, Paul, you and I, I think, have, have presented quite often in a number of ways. I know Larry has. I know Jack has. I know that almost everybody on the show has. And one of the things that, that kind of strikes me as interesting is I don't really remember many times where somebody stood up and said I was wrong or somebody called me out on Twitter or things like that. Now, that could be just because I'm lucky, but I think a lot of it has to do with whenever you speak about it, your expertise. You speak about the area that you're comfortable with and you're not pulling things out of your ass because lately... Um, and I'd love to get Jack's opinion on this. I have seen where people have been giving presentations and they've been wrong. And as soon as you're wrong, the knives come out. I mean, you look at the Twitterverse, it explodes. If somebody's wrong on even something that's a minute detail and, and that's, and that's hard. So I, I think Paul, you know, you talk about accuracy and you're working with your sales team. All it takes is one salesperson to yeah. say something that's incredibly incorrect. And that kills not just that sale, but a whole bunch of tangential sales. And that, mm -hmm. that has a lot to do with the rotation, too. It, it absolutely is. And, uh, and I, I think that it depends on who you are and where the role is. But if it's on the sales cycle, if it's intentionally misleading, um, that's really, really destructive. If it's um, a misinformed salesperson or misinformed marketing person, it's still bad. But if you own it, it minimizes the damage. And uh, we won't name any names, but everybody can think of their own favorite where some marketing PR or something organization for – I mean, we can keep it in, in the security industry, but technology industry has just gotten it wrong. Right, and there are two ways to, there are multiple ways to handle it, but doubling down on being wrong is not the way to. Handle it. <laughs> and there was just one of those earlier this week, and I, I won't name because there's so many, but it was a company that uh, doesn't allow pasting into password fields, breaking password managers. So there's 
arguably one reason for that, and it is if you do that multi-step thing, which annoys the crap out of us, where you have to put in your username here, your password in the next screen, because you're integrating two-factor or biometrics, or, you know, you're integrating some sort of two-factor, and so you're requiring multiple steps. You can make an argument for it. I think you should have better developers, but... I think you're hurting John's brain. Look it you, up. Can, you can make an <laughs> argument for it. But the idea that we're... Oh, you, you can't use a password manager because copy-paste complex passwords is evil. And the company's response was to double down on being wrong. Um, <laughs> it, uh. So so, uh, so I got a question for you, and this is something that I'm wondering is, 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 is a... Is a, is a kind of a problem of old age. I remember, you know, we're coming up on 10 years, right? And um, I've only been here for a short period of that, even smaller when you count the amount of times I've been on the show. But it used to be, we'd have no problem calling companies out many, many times. Like if somebody did that, we would call them out. And and it's kind of sad that, and, and Jack, I'm not ripping on you because I, there's a bunch of things I think I know who you're talking about and I won't call them out either. <laughs> but it, it, it's hard because... You know, you get ingrained in the industry as a whole, and it becomes very, very difficult to call these people out directly. It becomes very, very hard to look at companies and say, what the hell are you doing? You're doing it wrong. And and that's something that's kind of sad. I mean, there's we, a lot of... Yes, but. we we started, so that's why we love Squirrel Boy at attrition, right? Mm. You know, but Jericho you know, well, I mean, does it. Call but pe- you're call right. People we, out how publicly. do we burn, you know, how do you do it? So like on Twitter, I called this company out, but it's different because it, w- it was part of a thread... But we all have reputations, um, and we're tr- and the more we're negative to others, the more yeah that reflects poorly on us. We don't want to breed ten a culture years of ago, negativity. Ten years ago, when I was wallowing in in you know still the bulk of my income was consulting and working you know securing car dealers and other subhuman species. Um, see, I can still make fun of the car business. Uh, it was easier to say, hey, you know what? Uh, you don't want my money, I don't want to, and not only that, you probably don't realize what word of mouth is going to do to your income because you're an idiot, right? And But uh, just because we're not calling them out publicly doesn't mean we're not calling them out either. And as John no, said, we always get more ingrained in yeah, this yeah, industry. Yeah, but, but John, you're, sometimes a, better ways John, to do you're that. a business owner. you got to act like but, a grown-up, right? So Okay, but see, but that's part of the problem. You know, If we kind of leapfrog off that story, you know, we're, we're talking about trying to make the industry better. Uh, recently, an organization that I'm tightly affiliated with, um, I, I was giving a presentation, an at-night presentation, and I basically called out, I think, like seven vendors in front of 200 people. And when I was done, I was pulled aside, and it was basically like, you know that those vendors were in the audience with you, right? And I'm like, yeah, they were the ones wearing the shirts, I assumed. And they're like, you know that they're very angry with you, right? And I'm like, yeah, I guess. But it's, but it's like you said, you know, you got to be adults because now if I screw up and I piss off somebody, it affects not just me, but all the employees. It becomes difficult. And I think Paul's point is right. Even though you may not do it publicly, those uh, those conversations at the bar after, afterwards still happen. Right. Right. Yeah. And, well, and you never know when you might be working with the people you're calling out at some point in the future as well. I, think. I, I, <laughs> I mean, it happened, it's, fortunately, it wasn't someone that I had pointed out, right? But it was someone that had a relationship with outside of my day job. Now, all of a sudden, it's, hey, a relationship that's inside my day job. I have no so idea what you, you're talking you about. you go around throwing stones when everyone lives in a glass house, everyone's shit is going to break. It's not, all going to come crumbling down. in the situation, but in a prior <laughs> yeah. situation, there yeah, was a... It happens. We're, hey, we're going in this direction. That's cool. As long as we're not dealing with these assholes, like, oh, <laughs> why did everybody in the room just give me that look? Oh, shit. Uh, well, tell you what, folks, don't read my blog. Apparently, you don't read my blog because you wouldn't have invited me to this meeting. I think that there's another reason why we don't like to com- like publicly burn people because we know at some point, as much as we talk, as much as we do, we're going to screw up. Oh, we would honestly yeah. hope that somebody would ca- catch, us, uh, catch us a little bit of slack. Now, on there are truck. exceptions to that, like D-Link. <laughs> 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 or when you right click, you can download the PHP code. Right? Yeah. For way back from the day, remember yeah. that one? Oh man, we we got so much shit for that one. Oh, I don't even know how that came out I that way. I don't know. So either. anyway, I know uh, alcohol. Alcohol <laughs> does. Yeah. Now our friend so we've Bob, made so, mistakes. So, mm-hmm. as we've tangent, as we've taken this huge series of tangents away from the original <laughs> topic. This is like multi-dimensional just, tangents. It just reminds <laughs> me, you know. 
we don't hear from our friend Bob near as much as we, we used don't, to. No, we don't. And I that's think, um, oh, okay. So, uh, so that's not true. Bob does talk periodically to people the, from time to time, but but um, not like if you go back seven or eight years on this podcast. Yeah, Bob was Bob was like a guest every Bob, episode. Bob was a guest host. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I think Bob has gotten older and has started to enjoy more well, expensive. Liquor. I think Bob. Yeah. I, I think Bob went to prison or is in yeah. hiding somewhere. Yeah. Is really what happened. Bob. Bob. Um, but it goes to show you how much things have changed in the past 10 years. Right. Yeah. This might right. be a better cool. conversation for our 10th year anniversary yeah. show on October 16th, but things have certainly changed. And right. violating computer law is taken much more seriously now than it was 10 years ago. But there are things we can do. There are things we can do that will absolutely piss people off. For example, um, a week from tomorrow, Paul, uh, I, I haven't even told you yet, we're doing the uh, sacred cash cow tipping AV bypass presentation again. Yeah, I uh, just when you call me up and say, "Hey, Paul, we, we're doing a webcast in ten minutes. Can you make it?" I just show up. <laughs> yeah, show up. So, and and that one, if you don't remember, for those of you that uh, haven't been with us that long, that was the one where we bypassed every single one of the major AV vendors and provided slides uh, and step by step instructions and videos on how to do it. And uh, that'll be hitting, like I said, next Friday is whenever we're planning on doing that webcast. So my point on all of this and kind of the long tangent is, yeah, we may not piss people off as much as we used to. We're just far more targeted and directed on how we piss people <laughs> off because we're trying to make things better. Um, so so I just had somebody email me. It said, every single one of you on the show has, has uh, sold out. And the only thing I can say is, screw you. Um, so tune in next Friday <laughs> and we, we, will, we will take care of wow. that again. See, I don't get those emails that I sold out. I don't either. They, I do. They send them to John. They Me neither. Sold out. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's because they're afraid of you too, because um, because they're like that Bob guy will come and kick my ass. Yeah. So so John, quick question, and on that on that webcast, so you're revisiting the webcast. How much has changed, without giving it all away? Nothing. Um, <laughs> it, it, well, nice. It, it, with that is a couple of our interns are already working it, and they're like, hey, this crap that worked a year ago. Yeah. Yeah, it still works today. Um, so, I mean, if you look at the Veil framework, I don't. Did you guys do a tech segment or a show uh, show notes on Veil adding GoLang to their language support for? No, no. So this happened about a month and a half ago. The Veil framework. If you guys don't know, Veil is all about bypassing antivirus. Very, very uh-huh. cool yep. project. Also post exploitation, but they added in Go language as uh, one of their modules for creating malware. Now, Go is a language that was created by uh, Google. Uh, they got a whole mm-hmm. bunch of people from the C C days. And uh, they said, uh, if you were going to start from scratch, what would you do? And they came up with Go. And a lot of AV engines don't know how to disassemble or even review or do block analysis on Go executables. Hmm. Um, it's not a it's not a bytecode language. It's actually a compiled language. And they just freaking like they just roll over and it's like rub my belly. Um, <laughs> just, just bypass it. So. You know, the industry is moving forward as far as offensive techniques, but it seems like the defenders are still stuck where they were about a year and a half, two years ago. Yep, it's a cat and mouse game, and this it's time, o- this time, o- this time o- the only mouse, a couple the cat of is years. Old and tired. Yeah, but the cat is very, very, very fat and dumb now. Hey, hey. No, it wasn't you. Oh, and, yeah. oh. Okay, because I am fat. <laughs> so we were talking about talking outside the echo chamber. Oh. Do we have any more thoughts on that? Um, one, one final one from me. It, whenever you're presenting, seriously do a gut check and try to identify who you're presenting for. Are you presenting to try to explain a problem, or are you trying to present to show just how smart you are? Yeah. that's a, You should you know, never be to prove how, for smart, how smart you, you are. are. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. Um, some of the other points, when you're talking to um, the founders of a technology company, C-level executives, small businesses, or the general public, how does your message change? It's different, right? Yeah. They all have to deal with security in a very different way. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think that's one of the things we were saying here is you have to tune the message. The general public is the tricky one. Yeah, the general public is usually, usually our friends along, and family. The, along the lines of, can you hack somebody's Facebook account for me? Ugh. Yes, I can, and no, I won't. <laughs> so it, I was, what was there, a SANS uh, Internet Storm Center posting that said, uh, if you put into Google, how do you hack, 
the top suggestion was Facebook. I'm checking that right now. Hold on. I don't know if that's changed. I'm sure Facebook wasn't very happy about that. Let's see. How do you... Wow, John has a computer I... in his minivan. <laughs> Is it a minivan? <laughs> how do you hack a, a Facebook account? How do you hack a Wi-Fi, Fallout 3, and... Uh, would you like to ta play a game? It seems like you're our kind of person. No, wait, that's something different. Um, <laughs> Would you like to Google image search John Strand? <laughs> Actually, how does that come back these days? <laughs> no, it's checking on it. Thanks. All right. I would we hack John we're gonna, Strand. You know what we're going to do? Back. We're going to close out this segment, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about the stories for this week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 